In this video, we're going to take a look at file structs and the standard I.O. streaming functions. So up until this point, when we've wanted to interact with a file, we've used the raw syscalls read and write. Now, read and write operate on something that's known as a file descriptor. And typically, a file descriptor is obtained through the use of the open syscall. So we may do something like open home hacker class notes.txt, and that's going to return a file descriptor. Now, looking at our code example here, we see that the file descriptor is an integer. In fact, we can even call printf on that integer to figure out what the value is. Most of the time in your own code, the first file that you open is going to return the file descriptor 3. So what is the significance of this? And why do I need to pass this 3 back to the kernel when I want to interact with this file? Well, inside the kernel, for every process, there is a process file table. And this process file table is a listing of these integer values. And for every one of these integer values, there is a pointer to a file struct. And this file struct exists in a separate table known as the global file table. Now the global file table has an entry for every file that is currently open on the system. And the file struct inside the global file table is kind of the kernel's representation of the file. So it's going to have information like the path name, as well as the offset into the file. Now, what is the offset? Well, what happens if a process calls read on a file and then calls read again? We would expect the second read to continue from where the first one ended. The offset keeps track of where into the file are we currently accessing. Now, one of the additional fields that's in a file struct is the inode pointer. Now, the inode pointer points to an inode struct. If you've taken a file systems or forensics class, you may have explored the inode uh, in a bit greater depth. We're just going to say that the inode represents some of the lower level information about the file and how it is accessed on hardware. So it's gonna have information like kind of the sector block and then byte offset, where the physical bytes are located on the back media. So every time that we call a read, we are going to do a context switch into the kernel. The kernel then has to perform this translation from the file descriptor to the file struct to the inode to then grab the bytes off of the physical media to then context switch back to user land where we can then work with the bytes that we're trying to access from the file. This is a non-trivial amount of work. And this occurs every time that we call read or write. Can we do better? So libc has a class of functions that can be more performant. These standard IO streaming functions uh, include fopen, fread, and fwrite, and there's, there's many more. And now what's different about them? Well, first, if we look at fopen, it doesn't return a file descriptor. It returns a file pointer. Similarly, fread and fwrite also don't work on file descriptors. They're working on these file pointers. So let's take a look at their performance and then we'll talk about how they work. Okay, so up here I have a C program called readloop.c. Inside of main, uh, we have a buffer of size hex 1000 bytes. We're then gonna call open on dev view random. So we're gonna be reading in random bytes. Inside of a for loop, we call read, and we are reading in batches of hex 20 bytes. So we're going to read in hex 20 random bytes, and we're going to do this 50,000 times. So let's compile read loop.c. And let's see how long that takes to run. We see here it's about 0 0.014, 0 0.015 seconds. Okay, now I have a second C program called freadloop.c, which is very similar. We have a buffer of hex 1000 bytes. We're going to call fopen on dev view random. Inside of our for loop, we're going to call fread, and we're going to fread hex 20 bytes. And again, we're going to do this for 50,000 iterations inside of our for loop. So let's compile fread loop.c. Let's see how long this takes to run. 
Okay, so we see 0 0.004, 0 0.005. So roughly, it's it's about a third of the, the runtime. Now, there's one more thing that I'd like to kind of show, uh, and we'll delve into why in the next couple slides, but it's worth looking at right now. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to S trace each program. And we're going to redirect standard error to standard out so that I can grep it. And what I'm interested in is how many times does each program call the syscall read? So the one on the left here, which was our read loop, calls read 50,000 times, all well, about. And that makes sense because we're calling read 50,000 times in a loop. So, well, this one here, uh, we're calling read inside a for loop of 50,000. So we'd expect about 50,000 read calls. Now, in the second program, f read loop, let's do that same thing. We're going to s trace f read loop. We'll redirect standard air to standard in so that we can grep it. And I'm interested in the lines that begin with read. And we see that we have 392 instances. And that's significantly less. And remember, every time that we call read, we are doing that context switch from user space to the kernel. Then we're doing that translation across those tables to then go touch the hardware to get the bytes and then translate or context switch back to user land. And we're doing that 50,000 times when we call read. But using F read, we're only doing that 392 times. And that is the reason for this runtime difference. So let's take a look at why exactly that is. So these functions work on file structs instead of file descriptors. And the file struct contains a bunch of pointers that are used to buffer the reading and writing that's requested by user land. And because we reduce the number of raw reads and writes that actually occur, uh, there's less context switching, which results in increased performance. Now, I said that the file struct contains a bunch of pointers that are used for buffering. Here's some of them that we're going to talk about in this lecture. If you are interested in the file struct as a whole, I would highly suggest that you check out the link at the bottom of this slide, uh, which contains the source with the IO file struct definition. But to talk about buffering, we're just going to focus on these values here. Uh, the first is the flags value. Now, the higher order bits of the flags value is a magic value, and the rest of it is used for flags. Now, these flags indicate, for instance, whether or not the file is open for reading or writing. Uh, I believe in the source, the actual definition used is no read and no write. So if I wanted to write, I would set no read. And if I wanted to read, I would set no write. Uh, but the point is, is the flags value determines how the buffering is going to be set up and how we need to think about how we're going to interact with this file, right, conceptually. Uh, next, we have eight pointers. Uh, the first three are related to reading. Uh, there's a pointer, an end, and a base. Then there are three related for writing, where there's, a again, a pointer, an end, and a base. And then we have two that are related to the buffer as a whole, which has a base and an end. Now, the order here is a little weird, uh, but this is how it's defined in the source. Uh, the way to think about it is the base is the beginning of a region, the end is the end of a region, and then the pointer is kind of the, the current location that we're working with. Now, we'll see these pointers kind of move around in the next couple slides uh, to get an idea of how they're used. So when fread is called, you would think that you're going to be reading from a file like a file on the file system, but that's not actually what occurs. When you call fread, the function is going to immediately try and interact with this buffer in memory that should be holding bytes of the file. And this buffer gets loaded when, when needed with the bytes of the file. So initially, when we open the file for reading, uh, a buffer should be allocated uh, on the heap 
and it should be about a page in size. So it's going to be about hex 1000 bytes. The beginning of this buffer is defined by buff base, and the end of this buffer is defined by buff end. And since we're going to be reading, this buffer is used entirely for reading. So the beginning of the buffer is read base, and the end of the buffer is read end. So far, so good. Now, we've actually read zero bytes so far. We've just filled the buffer with the beginning of the file. And that's why our read pointer, uh, which kind of represents where are we currently in the file, is at the beginning of the buffer. Now, once we call fread, we've consumed some of these bytes from the buffer. When that occurs, the read pointer advances past all of the bytes that we've read. And so what's returned from fread is everything between buff base, or I'm sorry, read base and read pointer. And so those are the bytes that have already been read. Now, the next time read is called, it'll begin returning bytes from where read pointer is. And this will continue until we've read everything that is in this buffer. And at that point, read pointer has reached the end of the buffer and it has also reached read end. And so now we've consumed all of the bytes that are in the read buffer. At this point, we need to refresh the read buffer. And we do that by performing the syscall read. This is what happens under the hood. It's invisible to you when you're calling fread. But under the hood, uh, the function is going to call the syscall read and refill this buffer with on the next hex 1000 unread bytes and then it will reset the read pointer back to read base so that we can repeat this process. So we are only calling the syscall read every hex 1000 bytes, which is significantly more efficient if we're doing smaller reads. Now, at some point, we're going to reach the, the end of the file. And so we may read from the file, but not fill the buffer. And when we reach that point, what happens is we read in the bytes and we set read end to be the location in the buffer where the file ends. And read pointer is still back at read base because we just loaded the last chunk of the file into the buffer here. So then read pointer could advance until read end and that would be the end of the file. Now for writing, we're going to call fwrite. When you call write, normally it goes right to a file. But if we call fwrite, it's not going to go directly to the file. There's this intermediary buffer in memory that we're actually interacting with. And so when we think about it, fwrite is going to write to a buffer, not to a file. Now let's see how that works. Very similarly, buff base is the beginning uh, of this, this buffer. Buff end is the end of the buffer. Again, it's about a page in size, so hex 1000 bytes. Write base is the beginning of the buffer. Write end is the end of the buffer. Write pointer tracks where should the next bytes be written. Since we haven't written anything yet, write pointer points to the beginning of the buffer. Now, once we have called fwrite once, there'll be some bytes that get written into the buffer. And the write pointer advances to mark where is the end of the bytes that we have written. Now, the next time that fwrite is called, those bytes will be written to the address defined by the write pointer. And so what we're doing is we are slowly filling up this buffer with the bytes that we intend to write to the file. They haven't gotten there yet though. Right now, they're just sitting in this buffer. Now, once we filled the buffer and the write pointer reaches write end, we need to flush this out. And by flushing it, we're going to take the bytes that are in the buffer and actually commit them to disk or whatever it is uh, that is um, backing the file, right? And so when we flush, the write pointer jumps back to the beginning and the next bytes that we will write from fwrite will start at the beginning of the buffer. And this process can continue until we fill the buffer and flush or the function fflush is called. So you can manually flush a file. Now, one thing to kind of keep in mind when you're thinking about this is where is the file struct located? 
Well, it's actually located in user land. Where is this buffer located? Well, the buffer is also in user land. These are not memory addresses that are in the kernel. And we'll explore some of the implications of that in the next video.